All right, so today we're going to be doing a fireside chat with Arca, and we're going to be talking about some Halo lore. Last time he wanted to do something like this, it was pre me starting up Halo 4, and pretty much right after I finished, he said he wanted to do another one, and he's been writing a script for this, so he's got some stuff to put out. Um, let's learn some shit. Here we go. And we have Arco. Hi. And listening in on this is the Alfarius and the Stridor. Good evening. But mainly Ow. it's going to be me and Arco um, talking about... Well, I hope we're going to be talking about how grunts are the uh, biggest pain in the ass in the universe and they deserve to be purged completely. But I think he has other things to talk about. Go take it away, Argo. Okay. This little chat is going to be essentially how we went from Halo 3 to Halo 4. Okay. Just what events happened in the galaxy between those two games. Because you'll notice Halo 4 does little to nothing to explain how or why we are where we are. Or... It really doesn't do a lot to explain how Del Rios managed to be a captain with that much stupidity in his head. Yeah, no, yeah, no. <laughs> so, in order to explain why the hell, what the hell's going on and why the hell we are where we are, I'm going to have to talk about some of the Halo books. <clears throat> first half of this is going to be me explaining a bit about the books in question, and then the second half is going to be explaining what actually happened after Halo 3. Okay, Doug. Most of the information we have on that time period between 3 and 4 comes from a trilogy of books called the Kilo 5 Trilogy, written by Karen Travis, if that name means anything to you. Not really. I haven't read any Halo books, so... Yeah, no. Travis has written shitloads of books for various franchises. She's done some for Gears of War, for Star Wars, and other places. I don't know much else about any of her other work. The books she wrote for Halo in the Kilo 5 trilogy were Glasslands, The Thursday War, and Mortal Dictata, which more or less all take place one year after the Prophet of Truth died on the Ark. Um, Glasslands? Yes. Glasslands. I like it. I think I like her style already. <laughs> no? The Kilo 5 trilogy received a lukewarm reception at best by most people, and there are very few who tend to love it. <laughs> The the thing that she's not the Ann Watson level, is she? No, okay. but okay. it's the one thing you'll find most Halo fans agreeing on is that Kilo Five is the redheaded stepchild of Halo books. Ah, okay. The people who are most likely to enjoy Kilo Five are people who didn't grow up <laughs> with Halo and got into it later in life. Oh, okay. In my opinion, the trilogy could easily stand to be erased or rewritten and nothing of crucial value would be lost. Oh, okay. Kilo 5 is written like a sitcom dramedy. Oh, God. And you can very often see the hand of the author. None of the characters seem like they're living in the universe, even when they talk about events in the universe. It's plainly obvious that Travis wanted to engage in a dialogue with the universe and with its themes, but she did it in an overly tongue-in-cheek fashion where such was hardly appropriate. And all of the characters in her books feel real. They feel like real people, but they act like real people moving in a fictional world. So basically Star Trek Discovery, the book. I wouldn't know. But... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's accurate. There's that. There's also the very apparent, very overbearing hate boner that Kilo 5 has <laughs> for Dr. Halsey. Halsey isn't written poorly. She isn't made out to be stupid or given a change in character. But the Kilo 5 trilogy goes out of its own way to have every main character talk shit about her and all but spit in her face. Okay. 
there's even one scene of one of the main characters of the book looking at footage of Halsey breaking down and crying and enjoying the sight of it. It's just fucking weird, mostly. Okay, so basically this is... Um... This is essentially the art author trying to make us feel a certain way instead of engineering the universe to have us feel a certain way. Yeah. Okay, that's just that's just bad writing. If anything, it made me sympathize with Halsey more, which is very apparently not what the book wanted me to do. And that's precisely the problem. The book was trying to make everyone hate Halsey. Yeah. <laughs> Overall, Kilo 5 isn't my cup of tea, for many reasons, most of them being, well, it, it does some amount of damage to the franchise. The one Spartan character in Kilo 5 is used like a deus ex machina to fix any and all problems or challenges, and is written to be overpowered and unstoppable in combat, which is stupid. Karen okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, uh, okay, I'm not going to make the obvious Star Wars reference. <laughs> Karen Travis, she also portrays Sanghelios, the elite homeworld. She essentially makes it out to be a third world shithole that can't, that can't sustain itself, which is dumb and wrong and has been contradicted in other places in the law. That would make absolutely no sense. I would understand the Grunts' homeworld being a shithole considering what I've learned about them, but the elites, prior to them being betrayed on high charity, um, I don't think that would be the case in any way, shape, or form. I agree. That wouldn't yeah. make any logical or logical sense whatsoever for the Covenant to essentially leave in, like, to essentially disrespect the homeworld of their most powerful military arm. That is hey. fucking stupid. The logic, quote-unquote logic, was that because the prophets were the ones to handle most of the research and science and religious teachings, that for some reason that meant the elites had just stagnated to a ludicrous degree in that regard. To the point that they didn't understand how solar panels work, which is fucking stupid. Yeah, um, that's beyond fucking stupid. I will never... I'm, I'm not even going to entertain that course of logic. The third major issue with Karen Travis's books is, of course, she simply could not resist slipping in a feminist undertone to one of the subplots where it was hardly appropriate, and made no sense, and is contradicted by other law. So, yeah. What happened? <sighs> There's a thing with Sangheili culture that a bunch of authors have just... They've just completely failed to understand. Or if they do understand it, they choose to go with the most unimaginative course of action they can with it. It's a whole thing. Okay. So, yeah. Uh... Kilo 5 is still Halo, and we have to grapple with it. I, personally, grapple with it by taking its plot points and abstracting them to the point that all there is are the bare minimum details and basically ignoring that all of its characters exist. And that way we can take what little good it has to offer and leave behind the, the shit. <coughs> well, you do what you gotta do. Um, for me, I think it... Like, there have been books and series that I have read. There's been a, even a couple of 40K books that you could tell the author was essentially trying to get you to feel a certain way, to basically push their own viewpoint. And I'm just sitting there like, okay, you know, you can, you can make it obvious or you can... Because art is, you know, art in that particular form is supposed to be subtle. It's not supposed to be that overt. Like, I can't stand junk like that. Yes. Well, now that we understand where I'm getting the lore from precisely, I'll go ahead and explain, well, what we can estimate happened after the death of the Covenant. So, end of Halo 3, 
Fleet of Retribution defeats the remnants of the Covenant on the Ark, and the Covenant Empire effectively collapsed without the elites being its backbone. Think the fall of Rome times ten, except everyone still has reliable communications technology and transportation. Okay, so basically, um, the of, it, it's not even a question. The brutes couldn't hold things together. No kidding. <laughs> well, they were never really in charge. They were just muscle for the yeah. profit. The Covenant Empire didn't collapse all at once, but it did practically collapse within half a year, I think. It's rather vague. And what followed is a fragmenting of all of its species. The hunters, brutes, elites, jackals, and drones pretty much all went back to their respective homeworlds and or colonies. The grunts and engineers, having had no real power or ships of their own, essentially shacked up with whomever the old bosses were and stayed wherever they were told to. Hmm. Do you remember the return? Yes. Yeah. 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 The animation where the elite goes on that glassed planet to find faith again. It's mentioned, he, that elite mentions that the elites in general hunted down the brutes after the Ark. Not entirely accurate. The thing of it was, the the profit population on High Charity was almost entirely wiped out when the Flood uh, hijacked High Charity. And a sizable proportion of the profit population fled on a flotilla. Truth seemingly organized for that. And what happened was, what few brutes there were when Truth died on the Ark that were still militarized and still mobilized into fleets, they essentially went and bodyguarded for that profit flotilla, it seems. It could be wrong. But that flotilla of profits essentially fucked off to some random corner of the galaxy and we don't know where they are. So, basically, what you're saying is, the purveyors of the Lazy Boy continue to exist in some far, far-flung-off portion of the galaxy. And they, yeah. are, and they are protected by Monkey. They were, until they fled and left. And so, those few brute fleets that were still radicalized to do truths bidding posthumously... Yeah, they quickly became very disorganized and fought with each other, and there are, there were a few fleets that the elites had that hunted them down and had a few skirmishes with them, but that's really just backstepping. Humanity, meanwhile, pretty much just kept themselves and set about rebuilding. That's, that's literally it. <laughs> They were in no position to try and retaliate. <laughs> the economy was fucking in shambles, of course. So. Yeah, like the even if even if uh, what that guy was talking about in the video I watched the other day, that was on Installation Zero Zero's channel, is one hundred percent accurate. You're still you're st you're talking about upward losses of forty five percent of the species at that point, and that's low ball. And if we lost. If, like, if we lost half a, like, what would be a good thing? If we lost 500 million people, like, today, less than 10% of the population, the global economy would tank completely overnight into the gutter. It would, it would be completely guttered instantaneously. And it would take us years to recover. From that, I can't imagine losing even at the lowest estimates, which you don't you don't agree with at all. Even at the lowest estimates, you're losing nearly half of the population, which that would set humanity into a dep like it would make the Great Depression look like a hiccup in the stock market. <laughs> yeah. Well. And see. 
Well, yeah. see, not only that, the when the Covenant attacked, they wouldn't have attacked um, the less populated regions for glassing. They would have hit the cities. So you're talking major, major hubs are destroyed. You're talking uh, fleet ports. You're talking... Uh, planetary bodies with critical resources, all those other kind of things, and they would have hit the most populated targets first to decrease resistance, even though they really didn't have to care because they were whooping humanity's ass that badly. So that would be like eliminating every port city in America and every major city for about an hour and a half drive inland. That would effectively cripple the United States for decades. Mm, yes. So yeah, humanity, uh, they were just happy the war was over and wanted to rebuild and keep to themselves and shit, and the former Covenant Empire was essentially gone and everyone was left picking up the pieces. For that short period, very, very brief period, humanity happened to have the largest military in the galaxy if only because nobody else had one <laughs> yeah nobody else was <laughs> yeah and that would not last very long when an empire as big as the covenant crumbles it causes a lot of economic problems for the leftover people mm -hmm. with the death of the covenant you now have billions upon billions, maybe trillions of dollars worth of infrastructure and ships and space stations that are all left hanging about to be snatched up by anyone opportunistic enough. The elites, having had far and away the largest number of colonies and having been in command of the largest proportion of fleets and ships, were in generally the best position to take back ownership of all the leftover goodies. But it still all took a massive logistical toll, and many elite worlds and clans had to jockey for, jockey for position to figure out who would own what. I'd assume out of the out of everyone in the area, the elites would have come out the best out of all of them. By all estimates, they pretty much did, even if it, well, took a lot of effort and negotiation with each other. This process is, it would take years following the end of the Covenant and would be most of the way done by the time Halo 4 happens. But nowhere was it more difficult than on Sanghelios itself, the elite homeworld. This isn't because things became particularly difficult, but rather because, well, political problems. Uh. The Arbiter, after having slain Truth by his own hand, returned to his homeworld, the province called Vadam, and from there he would use his influence and power as the one who killed Truth, the great betrayer, to attempt to create a new Sanghili government. This government would be largely secular, and it was named the Swords of Sanghelios. However, as the Arbiter was attempting to curry favour, and go around to all of the Sangheili clans and city-states and provinces, he only found mixed success. A lot of the people were really on the fence about what precisely they should do. Uh, hi, I see. We're just doing a thing here. Uh, I see has joined us. Yes. So, it was during this, at the time, as the Arbiter was trying to play politics and get everyone on his side, there was a religious cult called the Servants of the Abiding Truth. The Servants of the Abiding Truth had existed in some form or another since before the Covenant was born. The elites had believed in the foreigners as gods before the Covenant was made. And the Servants of the Abiding Truth, this specific cult, they held on to their pre-covenant religion. So when the prophets betrayed the elites and when it was demonstrated that the halo array was nothing but a weapon and a tool, most former members, members of the covenant experienced some variety of religious crisis. The servants of the abiding truth didn't. 
If only because they had never subscribed to any belief in sacred rings or any great journey to begin with. And when a social structure is completely destroyed, the thing that's going to rise to the top is the thing that was underneath it the entire time. A little bit, yeah. So, when the Arbiter went around calling for a secular government and proclaiming any belief in the foreigners to be a lie, and specifically wanting to ratify a peace treaty with the UNSC, the servants of the abiding truth were rather miffed, and they denounced the Arbiter and all of his followers as infidels. The servants, however, were and are a cult of crazy people and couldn't really play politics against the Arbiter on an equal level. So they sp had to spend a long time gathering recruits. No. Here's the where here's the part where it gets fucky. <laughs> the Office of Naval Intelligence. Oh God. Proceeded to do a negative IQ move. See, the Unified Earth Government wanted to agree to peace talks with the Arbiter, and even wanted to cement an alliance with him. Oni, on the other hand, snorted a line of bath salts and chose <laughs> to do something rather different. Oni went behind the Unified Earth Government's back and decided to help the servants of the Abiding Truth and supply them with tools and weapons specifically so that the Abiding Truth could go right ahead and start a civil war against the Arbiter on the Elite Heavenworld. I asked fucking why... But that's like asking why it worked at something stupid. We'll get to why in a bit. <laughs> so. Long story short, this all led to a tiny little war. Sorry about that. This all led to a tiny little war happening near the province of Vadam on Sanghelios. The Servants of the Abiding Truth lost and they fucked off to some random backwater planet in the back end of nowhere because they achieved nothing. The Arbiter had a chat with a Lord Terence Hood aboard Infinity and we're not really given any concrete details what happened next. All we know is that the Arbiter would continue to be very busy on Sanghelios for the next five years, continuously trying to unify his homeworld under his banner. This was a period, the beginning of a period called the Blooding Years, and civil war would rage across Sanghelios for the foreseeable future. The Arbiter's government, though, continued to grow, and in fact had a much easier time getting clans from other planets and systems outside Sanghelios to sign on and support them. And the Arbiter would pretty much conquer or make allies with the vast majority of his planet by the time five years passed. The Servants of the Abiding Truth proceeded to do precisely jack shit. And nice. would do jack shit for the... For, forever. But what matters more in all of this, in this entire clusterfuck, is one particular man named Jewel Umdama. An elite. Jewel Umdama was a random, inconsequential shipmaster during the Human Covenant War. He didn't really like humans very much, he didn't trust them, even though he fought alongside the Arbiter to kill the Covenant when the Elites were betrayed. But still, he didn't like humans much. He'd lost a bunch of his fellow soldiers to them and such, and, you know, you know war. So, yeah. Jewel and Dharma, before that tiny war kicked off on Sanghelios, he joined up with the Servants of the Abiding Truth because they were planning to move against the Arbiter and stop any peace treaty from being signed with humanity. However, Julem Dharma found out that the Servants were receiving help from Oni and were basically taking marching orders from them. Oh boy. He really didn't like this and he proceeded to like it even less when Oni captured him, held him prisoner and ran experiments on him to try to create a poisonous strain of crop with which to contaminate Sanghelios' crops and cause an artificial famine. Oh, God. Which never happened, 
by the way, I'm pretty sure they dropped that plan for whatever reason, but... They're still yeah. fucking idiots. Yeah, so... Jewel and Dharma didn't like humans to begin with, didn't like that Oni was helping the servants of the abiding truth, didn't like it when Oni experimented on him like a lab rat, and he especially didn't like it when he found out that that tiny war near the Dam Keep just so happened to have killed his wife in all the fighting. As such. Maximum oof. Jewel Umdama blames Oni and all of humanity by extension for killing his wife and starting a pointless mass civil war in his home world. So as you can imagine, Jewel Umdama is a very unhappy man. A little bit. Thankfully, through a stroke of luck, he managed to escape Oni's captivity and wound up on a backwater elite colony world called Hesdros. And from there, he proceeded to use his cunning and charisma to manipulate the population of that planet into believing that he was a prophet of the Forerunners. Because the natives of Hesdros were rather isolated and they hadn't received very specific news from the rest of the galaxy and they were still widely religious. Mm. Jewel Umdama okay. created, uh, he created a cult of personality around himself and began to lead these people from Hesdros in a new quote unquote covenant. Jewel Umdama's covenant, however, is a tiny religious terrorist organization and is a far cry from anything approaching the Covenant Empire. I and many other Halo fans refer to Julem Dharma's Covenant as the Storm Covenant, specifically because all of his armor, weapons, and personnel are sourced from the Old Covenant's Storm Divisions, which were essentially backwater reserve forces. Oh, okay. Julem Dharma himself isn't religious, and he doesn't believe any of the shitty spews. He's a self-serving opportunist and manipulator, and he's only really out to seize power and control for himself. And potentially to help his species and to destroy humanity, because he doesn't trust them, but, you know. His Storm Covenant is barely a percentage of the total power or size that the Old Covenant was. It doesn't even have its own planets, really. It's just a massive fleet that floats around a bit. And it essentially spends all of its resources looking for Forerunner artifacts to scrounge and control as a means of gathering power and influence. Their quest to find Forerunner treasures culminated in their discovering of Requiem, and they are the ones that you're fighting in Halo 4. Ah, okay. So, nice. yes. The Storm Covenant is only one Covenant successor faction, quote-unquote, there are stated to be countless petty warlords all around the Orion Spur claiming to be inheritors of the Covenant of Old, but none of them hold the tiniest candle to the Old Covenant's majesty. And, yeah, that's the state of things. Yay! So, yeah, by the time Halo 4 comes around, humanity finally managed to... Uh, get the UNSC Infinity up off of Earth. The most powerful warship ever produced by humans. And it still ain't shit compared to half the Covenant ships. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd estimate it's in the 70th percentile, perhaps. It's. We'll get to examinations of its precise prowess later on. Point being that Infinity and another ship called Eternity that never got finished were meant to be Ark ships for the remnants of humanity to survive on if Earth ever fell. Oh, okay. So yeah, uh, while every other species in the Orion Spur was busy doing their own shit, and while the Arbiter was uniting all the elites under his banner, humanity very briefly had free reign to do anything and wasn't under immediate threat by anyone. And this is where you'll get sort of a lot of hubris from human characters in the post-Covenant War mm. era. 
they use the phrase we're the giants now which was never true and has never been true in any sense of the word so yeah 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 i get the i get the feeling that del rios is um decidedly the dumbest motherfucker in human existence uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, boss. If you want to learn how he became captain of the Infinity, I put it in a box. I'll I'll check that out after we wrap up here. So yeah, Oni, the Office of Naval Intelligence, they funded a religious terrorist group to sabotage the only potential allies humanity might have. And unintentionally ended up creating the Storm Covenant. Which, as you'll find out, causes a fair amount of problems. The Oni causes a fair amount of problems. The Storm Covenant does. No, yeah. Oni does. Oh yeah, but, you know. It's like, look, no matter how many guys Gold Magu Rocker kills, I still blame Eldrad for all of it. Because <laughs> if because if, if Eldrad wasn't an asshole, Gasgul would have died at the bottom of a hill. So yeah, that's everything I wanted to bring up. Does anyone else have any comments to pitch in? Well, it looks like everybody's good to go. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, and uh, this weekend I'll be finishing Halo Four. I am not sure if there is any other Halo games I will be able to play past that, but there is going to be some discussion on what I'm going to be doing next as far as uh, game day goes for Saturday mornings. Arco has really taken to wanting to put this kind of stuff out there, and I really enjoy hearing about it because I like anything, any kind of knowledge that goes outside of what I already know as far as other sci-fi universes, especially ones that I'm currently paying attention to, I enjoy. But for, in any case... Um, man, Arco, I appreciate it. Now I now I know why certain things are happening. I'm still a little bit fuzzy on some of the details, but that's neither here nor there. Oh, by all means, I'll I'll answer any questions right now if I can. Yeah, if I, I think the best thing for me to do is to form my own Q and A, especially after I finish Halo Four, and uh -huh. then go through. We'll just go through those a bit at a time. All righty then. In any case, that's it for me. Um, like and subscribe if you guys haven't already. If you like this kind of content right here, where we basically talk about sci-fi universes and stuff like that, especially with some with people that know more than I do, especially with people who know more than I do, um, just let me know down in the comment section. Until then, I'll catch you guys next time.